All right, we're nearly done and dusted now. We've got two to go. Where does the time go, you know? The Thai Grand Prix, this looks like a cracker, doesn't it? You'd love to go to this one. You know, there's, there's a lot that you put on your list. You know what I mean? The Thai Grand Prix, you guys are putting on a show there, you know, and you can feel the love through the TV of the people for the motorcycle. It's there. Same in all these Southeast Asian countries and stuff like that. I mean, I have a bike that, you know, is one of those bikes you can customize quite a lot. And all the videos you see, most of the best customs and stuff coming out of like Thailand and Philippines and things like that. So these are bike people. These are bike people and it shows through the television when you're watching an event like this. So brilliant atmosphere it looked like. There was quite a lot through the doors. I want to say a couple of hundred thousand over the course of the three days. However, seriously, take those numbers because I know a lot of people are returning. The same person returning every day kind of thing. But they add it all up as whatever. It's the way that Grand Prix attendances get judged so let's go through everything here as always we chapter everything below skip ahead to anything that's important to you we're going to start with the big boys this week we're starting with the title challenge and all that stuff thanks very much uh last week i said we're trying to get 700 subscribers for the end of the season we're at 693 so we picked up a couple during the week so welcome to our new subscribers uh and let's uh, push on and if we can get another couple this week and then another couple the week after we'll, we'll just about be on the 700 to finish the season so thank you very much let's talk the big dogs so first up just honestly get in the comments right now before the weekend rolls around before practice qualify who have you got 17 points now who have you got would you rather be i mean it's probably just too big of a gap to be like oh would you rather be chasing or whatever 17 points is defendable by just following the guy around. So Martin is in a very advantageous position at the minute because, first of all, he looks rapid quick every weekend, you know, to the point where even if Peko is looking extra rapid, Martin's right there. So am I right in saying that I've heard this, that if he just comes second, like even if Peko wins every race, the last four races, even if he just comes second in every race, he wins. Which basically means Peko needs to win every race. I'm not saying Martin will come second in every race because we know the likes of the Beast, Bastianini, and Mark, of course, uh, are quick enough to beat both of them on any day. So, and had Mark not have crashed there, I mean, there's this talk that, you know, it saved Martin a little bit because perhaps he's dropping more points to Banyai there. But I probably think Mark's winning that if he stays on. So, in that sense, I actually would have helped Martin because the it's a five point gap between first and second, but it's only uh what four point gap between second and third. So it actually might've worked out better for him if Mark had stayed on and pushed on and won it. So yeah, who have you got? I'm thinking Martin holds on from here. If I have to put my cards on the table, the only thing you can't predict in this situation is it's very much almost more a head game. It's almost more mental than technical now. So technically Martin can roll out Friday, quickest Friday, quickest Saturday. You know, maybe he wins the sprint or he 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 finishes ahead of Banyari in a sprint when when the when the big bucks are on the line, you know, and he's getting chased down. He's maybe he's leading or he's coming second and Banyai is just chipping away at him, a tenth here, a tenth there. Does he have his you know, can he hold his nerve? That's where it's gonna get that's the only thing you can't really predict. So you can predict now, like I'm saying, I think Martin holds on because technically I think he has enough in the way he rides, his speed, whether or not he can just stick on Banyaya's tail for another four races, which I think he absolutely can. But what you can't adjust for and what you can't predict for is maybe his headspace. Banyaya has a little bit of that kind of up and downness. He can throw it up the road at any minute, but you do know he's been in this situation before and you do know he's won before. So in that sense, you've got a world champion, a double world champion on your hands. We kind of know that, you know, what happened on Sunday. He just, he can put it together when he needs to. Can Martin? Can Martin? Last year, I mean, you could argue last year, or maybe he didn't get it done. Different as you approach the end of the season, he was chasing anyway. So perhaps it's a different situation. But generally, I, I don't think we've really seen Martin in this situation before. I mean, he's right in his hands now. It right is right there. He can reach out. He can touch it. He can taste it. He can smell it. It's there. So yeah, let me know 
who you're predicting. I'm taking Martine from here. 17 point gaps too much. Maybe if it was 10 points, 12 points, maybe I'd go for Peko just with the pressure on, on Jorge. To win your first in this way would be difficult. But yeah, I, I think it's 17. It's probably just a, a bridge too far for Peko. But let me know. And speaking of Peko, he, has, he can do this. He can do this. Every time you doubt him, he comes together. You know, like Japan, he did it. Whatever happened at Phillip Island, okay, he wasn't quite all there. And then this week comes out again on Sunday and delivers in very tricky conditions. Uh, like I said, maybe fortunate the mark went down, but he stayed on two wheels and he was definitely quicker than Martin in those conditions. Who We saw he had his moments. Maybe he was riding a bit stiff with a bit of pressure on his shoulders. Maybe he couldn't loosen up. That's only going to intensify now as we go forward. Peko was excellent. Let's talk a little bit, just quickly touch on the sprint just while we've got it fresh in our minds here. Uh, and A. Bastianini, excellent. Sort of thinking had conditions stayed similar for Sunday. Is he your race favorite for Sunday? Obviously, we don't know him much as a wet weather specialist. So he does did look to struggle a bit on Sunday. He crashed out anyway, I do believe. But yeah, Saturday, excellent. Uh, and we saw the, is this the first time we've had it? Is it the, uh, sorry, the, first, the only time we've had it. I don't think it'll ever happen again. Uh, the top eight riders being Ducati. I think that's it. I don't think we've had it before. Uh, and imagine being last in that. Fabio Di Antonio, you bloody loser. Uh, I'm just kidding, obviously. Because uh, he was excellent on Sunday. But this was cool to see. I, I mean, it is and it isn't. It's like, oh God. Eight Dukes and like nothing else. Binder, Fabio, Miller after that, I guess. Like, whatever. I mean, it was fortunate because, I mean, Pedro, I think, would have split them somewhere, fourth or fifth or whatever. But him, his crash sort of left it as a top eight. And is that good or bad? I can't see him being this dominant any time soon after this season. Maybe they will be. I mean, they only got six bikes next season. But are we going to get a top six Ducatis? Uh. I mean, you still could. It's six strong riders next season. So depending on how quickly Thurman the Vermin picks it up. Yeah, are we going to see this ever again? And we'll, we'll touch on that Acosta getting a podium on Sunday. Now, this battle for third was the highlight of the weekend. For me, it was brilliant, wasn't it? I was right in there with Miller. I could just feel that he just wasn't going to have enough to hold Acosta off in the end, and he didn't. And he actually got passed by DG in the end as well, uh, who had a fantastic race on Sunday. Now, hard to know where... You know, the likes of Morbidelli would have got to in that race because he's always good in, I like to say, low grip conditions. So wet weather being one of them. You know, he's always good when you get to circuits where they talk about there's low grip. He always has a good weekend at those ones. And then he's had a, having a good race here again and he's had a brain fade. But this battle for that, we'll touch on that anyway. Maybe during the All Japan Cup stuff because we'll talk about Fabio and maybe we'll talk about Morbidelli while we're doing that just to mix it up a bit. But yeah, Miller was fantastic on the day. It's good to see him get some kind of result here, beat his teammate, you know, on his way out now in Niso, um, on his way to Pramac. So we don't know how many podium challenges he's going to put together in the future now. So hopefully in the last couple of races he can get one. But yeah, this was a strange one. I've seen a lot of guys go down because of the conditions. Yeah, tell me what you made of this one. It was obviously a lot more entertaining because of this battle for third than what it, what it could have been and what we saw. Where was that real dull one? <laughs> entertaining battle for third. I really enjoyed that. It was my favorite part of the Grand Prix. Now, a couple of off-track bits. The major one is uh, the Maniac is back. Andrea Janone is now going to be back in MotoGP. <laughs> think it's for both races i'm pretty sure he's confirmed for because i mistakenly said last week that uh digi was going in for surgery and was going to miss these last three and was getting replaced i was wrong he raced this one and then he's scheduled in for surgery now and he'll miss the last two so for malaysia we're getting uh you know i have to imagine it's for valencia as well so it was talk of bulliger with his fantastic season in, in super bikes. And I would have liked to have seen that, but this, I did say last week, this is the fun chaos option. And I absolutely kind of love it. And I'm keen to see how he does. I'm really, am keen to see how he does because you've got a guy who was a top MotoGP rider in his day. MotoGP career cut, cut short for, for certain reasons. And certainly not because he was too slow. 
so let's see how this works out for him because I am excited to see. It will be good to see him on a MotoGP bike, back on a Duke as well, back on a Ducati for, for the uh, unpredictable Italian. Uh, and the other one was, I mean, not much going on off track. There is obviously the, a little bit of chat, uh, Joan Mir having a chat about Marquez for that, that hard pass. I mean, you can tell me what you think of that. I don't really care about that. Um, uh, whether you think it was a fair pass or not, if it was a bit overzealous or if he deserved the penalty or whatever. I've just said I didn't really go, want to go into it, but it was an interesting point that how Mark got out of this penalty, I think, because I he was told to give the position back and then I never saw him give a position back. I was watching the timing thing. They didn't really show him at that moment coming through the field, give a position back. I didn't see a replay of it, but apparently what's happened He's apparently quickly given a position back, but not to me. He passed someone, quickly gave it back, and then just ca- carried on. So he didn't have to drop back like the two or three seconds he'd put between him and me by the time the penalty came down. He quickly got past someone else, gave it back, and then got past him again. Tacker or someone. But a bit cheeky. A bit cheeky way to serve it. But I guess technically, if you've done it the right way, in that in those instances, it's like, should they just give long lap just so that he has to lose the time? I don't know. Tell me what you think. It was not much on my radar, this one. Like, is that a fair way? Should you have to give it back to the guy that you took, that you did it? Or is it just give up one position? If you take a position and give a position, is that technically dropping a position? Because from the moment you got, say you're running, don't know where he was, 14th when you get the penalty. And then you go up to 13th. So instead of going from 14th to 15th to serve your penalty for the guy that you obstructed you're going up and down so you've never really dropped that position you're you've held position i don't know tell me what you think there's several ways to look at it uh, and the only other thing was a bastianini saying i was thinking he's done an interview or something or someone's asked a question will you be helping peco from now on and he's basically just said it's too early put ultimate round a bit early in it but look he wants to win in malaysia he doesn't give a shit to be honest does he He's effectively been sacked from Ducati. I know they probably would have kept him around in a Pramac or something if they could. Well, not a Pramac because they're gone, but you know what I mean. They probably would have kept him on a... He probably would have had Digi's 2025 bike. Do you know what I mean? If he wanted to stay, but we know they don't want to stay when this happens. So he's effectively been sacked. He's had to go and get a job somewhere else so that he doesn't get dropped from, fa- from that factory. Basically, I think unless it's literally the last round and he has to concede just one position, like, oh, he's behind me, I may as well just give it up so that he wins the championship. I think unless that's the situation, he ain't doing shit. He's not running around three positions ahead of him in Sepang with another round to go after. It's me like, I'll drop back so he gets one extra point. I'll drop two positions so he can have one extra point. Yeah, that's not happening here. This guy just wants to finish as high as possible as many races as he can. And now the All Japan Cup. Fabio was going to win this by fucking mile uh he was running fifth when he was taken out by morbidelli and we said we're going to talk about morbidelli in this bit a little bit so frankie has this thing where i'm a big fan of frankie but he has a weirdly poor judgment in these situations he's done this one too many times for it to be an accident now (laughs) it's just ridiculous isn't it that was a that was a shocking one um so come on frankie tone it down lad just make better decisions you know just say no now so Fabio was, I don't know how long he could run in that position, but he was having a great weekend. He was running fifth. He was being overtaken by Frankie was trying to get into fifth. Now, Frankie, like I said, he's always quick in those conditions and in low grip conditions. So he probably was pushing on ahead of him, but there's no reason to believe that Fabio couldn't have been in that fight at the ends with your Millers and Digis and whatever. So it really has cost him. That means that this week's winner is Johan Zarco. He goes to 87 points, consolidating his second place. Very hard to catch now. He's, uh, 16 points ahead of Taka. It's almost done that for second place. So Zarco won it. Luca Marini has picked up a All Japan Cup podium second place this weekend. He has finished, and you know what? He's not even been top Honda. He's finally got himself a really good position, and he's not top Honda, but he's second Honda of four finishes. So this was a Honda lockout this week. One, two, three, four. It's a bit like the Ducati thing. This is almost as impressive as Ducati's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is an all-Japan Cup, 1, 2, 3, 4, for Honda. Zarco, then Marini, then Taka, then Mir. Fabio finished the race, I believe. He's classified here. 50 seconds 
off the lead, 20 seconds off the back of Juan Mir. It looks like he's finished the race. So we're classifying him for two points. And Rins didn't finish the race. Fabio, as we mentioned last week, that he'd actually won the All Japan Cup the week before that in Japan, of all places. And I, I didn't even realize, and I forgot to mention it. Uh, but he's your All Japan Cup champion. Zarko, like I said, is consolidated second now. He needs a nightmare to happen for Taka. He need Taka basically needs, well, he can level on points with a win and a second if Zarko doesn't score. And the only way you don't score is if you don't finish. I say that if we do get some wild cards in the last couple of rounds on Japanese bikes, you can actually not score by finishing seventh or worse. So I don't think Zarko's going to do that though. Uh, so we'd have to not finish for Taka to draw level on points with him now. Um, Taka is third. Oh no, Taka can actually be caught for third by Rins. He's 19 points ahead of Rins. So Taka goes to 71, Rins stays on 52. Luca Marini, in a hammer blow to Juan Mir in the battle for fifth, has gone three points ahead of Juan Mir now with two rounds to play, and neither of them like to score big points. So that could be him finishing ahead of Mir in the All Japan Cup. How do they look in the actual World Championship? Marini has eight, 13 points, and Mir has 21. So funny how this works out. Mir's pretty well done a lot better than him i'd say i mean eight points is that a lot better maybe maybe not it is for them because that's a lot of points for them to score but marini and marini's form actually has scored he's outscored me a lot in this last run of the season me has not done that much has marini had a better season than juan Mir? just food for thought uh stefan bradle and then remy as always they're there okay me only on 42 points that's moto gp done and dusted for this week let's talk moto 2 we have a new world champion it's ayagura this was a tasty one one there was a bit of drama in this one this was kind of fun this race it got called off a lap early for weather chantra looked filthy with that because he was trying to hunt down a third place podium at home but the weather sets in the weather sets in that's all you could do was chasing ramirez down it would have been a great i mean he was five seconds oh no he was really closing it he was only a second back from ramirez he probably was a chance to podium. Um, but this one had a bit of everything, I guess. Furman the Vermin's crash early where he took out, I want to say, Arbolino in that. Went in absolutely wild. It was like Mark on bloody Oliveira at uh, Porto Mel, wasn't it? A little bit. He just went fucking flying in there. Was not as much damage caused. Um, suggestion on commentary, and I would never have thought of this, but uh, was it Michael Lavity? This is what happens when you have a Grand Prix rider in the Thing, they can see these things that us laymen can't see. Michael Laverty suggesting sometimes that can happen if you get a, a false neutral or you miss a gear or something like that and it, you can't pull it up because the engine's not braking anymore. I understand. I didn't hear anything else to suggest that that may have been the case. I've not actually watched any post-race stuff and, and obviously I watched it on replay. I watched the MotoGP live but I watched the um, Moto2 on replay later so I didn't just sit there and watch the post-race Moto2 stuff. Housework and that on a Sunday. You're going to get shit done, don't you? So I don't know what the actual actually happened there. I don't know if he's been given a penalty. Please let me know in the comments. Was this just a kid getting it wrong or was this a technical problem he had? But yeah, that was a bad one. Aaron Kinnett really positioning himself to be the man to beat going into next season. He'll start next season probably as the favorite now. Probably. And of course, yeah, Igor is your world champion. I think it was inevitable this from maybe... Even two or three races ago, it looked like they weren't going to catch him. Kinnett was coming from too far back, and he was the only guy that looked to have any real form to try and catch him. But look, it is... I, I agree as a favourite of mine. I really like the kid. The fact that he's said no to Honda, allegedly as many times as he had, he wants to go in his own way. He wanted to be Moto2 World Champion. He wanted a team other than Honda to want him in MotoGP. And if he was good enough to make a team other than Honda to want him in MotoGP, that just means someone wants him because he's good enough. Not someone wants him because he's the best Asian in the field, which is kind of what happens. He's being wanted for something other than that, and that's for his extremely good ability to ride a motorcycle. And what more can he want? Brilliant for him. I really like the kid. Okay, we're not going to dwell too much on Moto2 and Moto3 this week. We're cracking through it. Moto3, what happened in this... Uh, oh. David Alonso, the extremely likable little Colombian, wins again. Uh, water's wet, you know, as they like to say in these situations. But this one was good. I mean, it's Devo for Kelso, a pole position, well done, lad. And scrapped, was scrappy, was scrappy. 
bit of a scrappy do out there. Caught the worst of it again. So the the two weeks where I've actually been like, Kelso's actually got his elbows out in a way that I really appreciate. He's actually been, it's worked out kind of worse for him because he's been just punted off the road a couple of times. But I'd rather see this happen to him when he's trying to stay near the front than those ones where he loses position, loses position, loses position, loses, and never ever makes his way back up. The kid fought like a dog. Well done. He's ended up seventh. He should have been in that lead fight at the end, especially with it being a shortened race. It's only 12 laps. And that, I thought, suited him to the ground. I thought it was a real chance to podium, if not be in that group for the win at the end. You're not beating David Alonso, so let's maybe say he had a chance at second or third, but it didn't work out for him. But it's good to see him being in that fight. It was an entertaining group, and we had a bit of drama at the end with Furusato going down. I think it was Vire he made contact with. I couldn't give fault to anyone here, I don't think. They kind of, it was, it was a bit of this. It wasn't this or this. It was a bit of this, if you know what I mean. He's Finished fifth by sliding over the line. So well done to him. I was worried for him for a second because his name was tumbling down the little totem pole there on the side of the screen. I'm like, no, surely his bike's crossed the line. And he did get classified in fifth place in the end. So fair enough. Uh, Luca Lanetta, who I really like. I maybe overrate the Italians a little bit sometimes. But I do think this kid looks class and primed to sort of be one of the you know lads that pushes and takes a step for next season. I mean, along with, obviously, others, but he stands out for me. Who's the other one that I always... Oh, yeah, Picaris is an obvious one. Picaris is probably the guy for next season in terms of the guys are going to make a big step, but I think Lynetta's right there, and I'm hoping for Ralston that he's right there as well. Uh, but, yeah, this well, this was fun again, but David Alonso wins, and that's it. We're done for another week. We'll see you in... Where's the next one? Sepang, one of the great circuits. The great circuits. So we'll see you for that one and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Take it easy.